everybody. <laughs> um, so for those of you who were here in the last session, um, I'm Nicole Allen, director of uh, the National Textbook Affordability Campaign for the Student Public Interest Research Group, which is a national nonprofit advocacy organization that works on a variety of public interest issues, um, environment, consumer protection, government reform. Um, we have chapters on about 100 campuses across the country where students um, engage in, in, in these campaigns. Um, and my job is to direct our national program for textbook affordability. Um, and the purpose of this session is to just dive in a little bit deeper into um, kind of where open textbooks are at right now. So um, four years ago when I started working on this campaign, um, open textbooks wasn't really a thing. Um, open educational resources were definitely developing and really burgeoning the movement. Um, but it was really more focused on, on the more resource type things, um, the, the multimedia, the um, modules, and uh, things like that. Um, and the idea of an open textbook uh, kind of hadn't uh, entered the mainstream yet. And uh, we've just sort of seen how open textbooks over those years have become not only um, mainstream within our community, but really covered by the national media and something that, that a lot of professors and, and colleges are aware of and, and actually enacting policies to support. So um, just want to take a look at where open textbooks are at right now and, and kind of what the trajectory is for the future. Um, the, my half of the presentation is going to be focused on kind of the just where, what faculty think, what students think. Um, what we've been seeing in the media. And then Eric, um, my co-presenter, uh, the president of Flat World Knowledge, is going to share some of their sales data with us um, and just the data they've collected on, on usage and um, what students are buying, what faculty are saying. That'll give a really great snapshot of what the state of open textbooks is now. So um, I think everybody here knows how expensive textbooks are. Um, <laughs> And uh, yes, I am using a few slides. Um, for example, popular calculus textbook, $224.95, insane. Wow. Students are spending over a thousand year dollars per year on textbooks on average according to the college board. So this is just a huge problem. Not a surprise that open textbooks um, have really become a very appealing solution to so many um, different people. Uh, and then um, if you put that just in context with uh, what students are spending on tuition, you know, uh, the DAO found that students in community colleges are spending pretty much almost as much on, on textbooks as they are on tuition. So, um, and, oh, and then also prices have been increasing dramatically. And it's only continued to go up. Actually, just in the four, past four years, prices have gone up 22% on average. So, obviously, the market is right for a solution. Open textbooks provide that solution. Um, and just to quickly review where we're at right now, open textbooks have been adopted over 3,000 classes. They're used at some of the nation's top institutions, Harvard, Berkeley. Um, and we're seeing a lot of models developing to support sustainable development of open textbooks. And then just to give you two examples of open textbooks, um, this is one published by an individual professor. There are a lot of free digital options, and you can also get a hard copy bound book for $25. Um, or print it out. Ironically, it costs a little bit more to print it out just because it's not as efficient. Um, and then here's an example of one of Flat World Knowledge's open textbooks um, and the various options that are offered for that. Uh, free online version and then um, optional digital versions and study aids and hard copies. And then we also have uh, a lot of other cost saving measures out there on the market besides open textbooks. We see e-readers, we see e-books, used books, renting. Um, and this is just a kind of a summary of how much students can save by taking advantage of all of these options. So, um, it, I mean, some of them are pretty great, like renting 61%, that's pretty substantial savings. But if you think about it, not every student wants to rent their textbook, not every student wants to buy an ebook. And um, just putting that all in perspective, if every student took advantage of, who wanted to take advantage of rentals, e readers, and e textbooks actually did, that's the maximum amount that they could save, that um, we would reduce textbook costs for students. So open textbooks far and away um, are, are the top solution and, and why we really want to prioritize um, moving forward with open textbooks. Um, so uh, now I'm just going to run through a few statistics we've gathered over the years um, on, on what students and, and faculty think. So we, um, in a recent trade show, uh, we 
uh, surveyed faculty who came by our table and just gauged their awareness of open textbooks and, and, and their interest in them. So about two-thirds had heard of open textbooks, which is pretty good, I mean, when you think about it, uh, that this was a concept that just wasn't in existence about four years ago. Um, 33%, uh, about a third, actually could give a good explanation of what open textbooks were. Um, 13%, so more than one in 10, had considered using an open textbook, which is great. I mean, that, like, if 10% are all professors everywhere, um, it doesn't necessarily translate. But that's considerable pressure um, on the market of 10% or 13% are considering these options. And then actually 3%, 3 in 100, had actually used an open textbook. Um, and the great thing is that 96% would want to use an open textbook if they could find one. Students. Um, we uh, conducted a few student surveys over the past couple of years um, just to look at where students are at. So um, about 75% prefer print, 25% prefer digital. That means that what we need is kind of a blended option, um, something where students who prefer print and prefer digital can use their preferred format and aren't forced to choose one or the other if they're really expensive. Um, about two-thirds want to keep books for future use, so renting is not a complete solution, and having access through open textbooks is a great way to fill that. Um, and this is a really startling statistic, about 70% of students report not buying one of their textbooks due to cost. So there's a significant issue um, with, with access to materials and success in classes that open textbooks could correct. Um, and most of those students actually believe that doing so will hurt their grades. Um, now, just quickly looking at, at media, um, many of you know that open textbooks have started to enter the mainstream media, have been covered by a, a lot of different major outlets. Um, just looking here, the number of unique articles mentioning open textbooks over the last three years, so on the, on the right, far left, um, it's 2008 to 2011, we're up over 200 a year, which is amazing. Um, and then just, uh, you know what, we started a little bit late, so I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit um, and just run through a quick sequence of how much open textbooks can save students. So um, we found that on average, uh, a, switching from a traditional textbook to an open textbook will save students about $100 per student per class. Um, so that means in a 100 student class, you're saving $10,000, um, assuming a five classes of a particular school, that's $50,000, and um, two semesters in a year, that's $100,000, times um, how many professors, how many institutions across the country, so they're just tremendous cost-saving potential. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Eric from here to give us more of a snapshot of um, where uh, Flat World Knowledge's numbers have Hi, thanks everyone. Um, so I'm going to just try to provide a, a, a little snapshot of um, just one commercial open textbook company's numbers. Um, so to take this sort of macro perspective and bring it to a, a sort of more uh, specific and micro level. Um, and I'll, what I'm going to talk about is sort of authors uh, and faculty adoptions um, over a three year period. Um, looking at the curve on those things, um, look at um, both formal adoptions in classrooms where a book is an open book is displacing the use of a proprietary textbook. That's how I define a formal adoption. And also informal use data, um, purchase data. What, what do students use when they're confronted with free and a series of paid choices? What do they do? Um, and then some success data, maybe the most important thing. Uh, is it having a positive impact on students' performance in the classroom or not? Um, so I'm not going to cover this extensively. I think I've, I've gone over this a few times in the last few days, and I think there's some familiarity with it. But basically, our um, commercial open textbook model is really made up of these three things. So we publish um, textbooks the way the traditional industry has. We go out, we actively recruit a leading scholar or teacher in their field to write an exclusive textbook for flat world knowledge. Um, we apply lots of oh, sorry, editorial resources <coughs> to that textbook. Um, so we have editors, we have uh, people who um, fact check, we have extensive peer reviewers um, uh, peer reviewing the work, uh, and we develop it into a textbook, and then we fully support it with teaching supplements, test banks that fit into LMSs, um, uh, PowerPoint slides, instructor manuals, and things people are used to using in order to adopt the textbook. 
that's all basically about equity. It's about getting on the playing field with traditional publishers. Where we differentiate and offer more value, in our view, is by making them open. So we apply a Creative Commons open license to those books when they're published, transferring legal control to faculty to now uh, think of this book as a platform instead of a static textbook. And we provide a platform which we call Neo or Make It Your Own. It's a web-hosted platform where faculty can come in and they can pretty much do anything to that textbook. They can click and drag and drop chapters and sections into a new order. Um, they can click on any element within the book, like a paragraph, open up a web editor, add links to it, swap out an example for a local example students might be more familiar with, maybe make a book more locally or culturally uh, relevant to their students. Um, uh, insert uh, documents, so you can go in between paragraphs and say I want to upload a, a Word document or a PDF document. Uh, you can insert video uh, from Blip TV or YouTube, and it'll render the player directly in the book. And all of that is sort of point and click. Uh, when you're done uh, and you click publish, our publishing engine will automatically make that book with those changes available within minutes in multiple formats: HTML, uh, PDF, EPUB, um, Mobi, which is the file for the Amazon Kindle. Um, uh, digital Braille um, and uh, Daisy readable files. And so all of that becomes available to the student uh, and then we build a business model around how to make that available to them. And that's where we get to sort of the third part of the model which is student choices. So the student enters through a free online version. So everybody in the world can go to the catalog today and read all the textbooks for free online through any web browser. Um, what we charge for uh, is basically saleable format. So if you want to get off the web and download something to your device, to your phone, uh, or to your computer, um, you can do that. So you can buy those EPUB files for your, for your iPad or your iPhone. You can buy those Kindle files for your, uh, the Mobi files for your Kindle. You can download a PDF that you can then install on a device, computer, or print. Uh, you can buy black and white or color copies, which we print on demand uh, through a partner and ship directly to students or through college bookstores. Uh, and we also provide optional study aids for students. So every chapter of every book has an audio study guide, a set of flashcards, and quizzes that students can purchase by the chapter or by the book. Um, that's fundamentally the business model. Um, so let's talk about authors and adoptions. So just so you can see, so um, in blue is basically our new, co new author contract signed um, year by year since we started the business in 07. Um, so we're sort of averaging somewhere in the... 25 um, new books per year that we get under contract and then of course it takes a while to start to develop those but you can now see uh, the number of titles we're publishing annually is starting to grow uh, collectively we're up um, into the 60 titles now uh, aimed to have 125 within 18 months um, most of those are business economics books or the big core general education courses um, Faculty adoption. Um, the first book we published was was really um, we started to do some um, beta testing in classrooms in 2008. Uh, we had 352 faculty, uh, unique individual faculty, formally choose to adopt uh, one of the open textbooks that fall. If you fast forward a year, uh, 889. Uh, and you fast forward to this semester that we're in right now, um, 1700 roughly. So uh, good good growth um, uh, trajectory. Uh, for us, and we can expect that to continue to grow um, exponentially because we, we add more textbooks, so we can set, continue selling the ones that we have. So uh, we should see some, some really healthy growth on that number uh, by next fall. Um, those 1,700, uh, if you look at how many institutions they represent, um, 737 unique colleges in the mix. Um, so actually getting really sort of widespread usage, which what's important about that for us is it's creating a lot of um, footholds in a lot of different places. Um, and, and what we see is once we get an adoption somewhere, that turns into two adoptions within a semester, and then we start to see a diffusion pattern. Um, what kinds of schools uh, do those make up? Um, that's the breakdown of the 737 schools. I lost four somehow in the data. Um, but, uh, but basically 20 international <coughs> adoptions um, where they formally adopted. Uh, lots more international usage, but not formal adoption. 37 high schools, which are basically using college textbooks in the high school curriculum. 162-year, uh, 216-four-year private, and 304-year public. Um, I expect this number uh, a year from today to be the biggest one. The, the 35 first books we published were business and economics. They skewed to a four-year business school curriculum. Uh, but as we publish more gen ed books, we see huge growth in the, in the community college space. Um, 
uh, international adoptions are coming from everywhere, from Austria, ben Belgium to Kosovo, Malaysia, um, uh, Switzerland, and the UK. Um, an interesting number that I haven't quite figured out yet. Uh, when we look at the, uh, the age demographic of adopting faculty, the number one demographic was a shocker for us, and it's been consistent every time we do this, um, which is people who taught over 20 years in the classroom. Um, then the next biggest one is the one I would have, of course, expected to be the biggest, which is people one to five years. Uh, and I actually kind of get this, right? This I understand. Um, I'm not waiting to print textbooks, and I'm much more uh, computer savvy and open to new things. This I've actually, in conversations, I think figured out. It's I actually am so comfortable with what I do in the classroom that I'm willing to take more risk. I don't really, I'm not worried that if the book blows up on me, I'm in big trouble. I've got my notes, I've got everything, and so I'm willing to do something that's going to be benefit my students. These are all over the place, and I have no idea why. Um, can't figure that out. Um, the uh, uh, when we ask faculty who adopt, um, the top reasons for adopting a textbook. Why did you do it? Um, these are the, the top ten reasons that we get. Um, free online is the, is the biggest driver uh, by a, a significant factor. The quality of the content of the book. Um, the prices of all the alternative formats being affordable. Uh, the availability of those format choices. Um, number five, just simply I believe in this idea uh, of an open textbook uh, and was drawn to this. Um, six, the availability of supplements, the ability to customize the material, the ability to have more control over new editions. No publisher's going to come and say, you have to change to a new one. We allow faculty to change if and when they want to. Integration with the LMS and author reputation are the reasons for adopting. Um, top reasons for not adopting. So when we ask faculty who looked at the books, why didn't you adopt? Um, basically, uh, not surprising, people have very unique ways of teaching, and the book didn't fit my way of teaching, and either it was too different to use your custom uh, engine to change it, or I'm just not interested in spending the time to do that. Um, number two, not surprising, too busy. Um, that's pretty consistently the top reason faculty don't change from a traditional textbook to another traditional textbook. Uh, didn't like the contents. Uh, strong relationship with my current publishing um, representative. Uh, not teaching this semester, uh, didn't like the teaching resources um, that came with it, fearful of a new company and whether it's going to be around for the long term, um, didn't get a desk copy, that's not a good one for, from our point of view, requested a desk copy, never got one. Um, don't understand how to adopt it, it's different, it's a different process, I don't just fill out a requisition form and give it to my department assistant to bring to the bookstore. Um, didn't understand how my students were going to actually get to this material and, and use it, and that made me nervous and then sort of the ubiquitous all other. Um, uh, on top of that um, uh, formal adoption traffic, we have about uh, over 200,000 students this semester in formal classes using it, but in September and October of this month, we also had 157,000 and 145,000 informal learners. So people who came in um, and, and entered the reading environment, read more than three pages of a textbook, but weren't in a formally adopting <coughs> classroom. So lots of informal uh, access and usage of the open textbooks as well. Um, purchase data. So what are students doing, given that, that range of choices? 46% um, of them are reading for free only. They access the web version, good enough for them, and that's what they do. Um, that means 54% are, are purchasing something. Um, the biggest chunk of that are black and white textbooks. We sell almost no color textbooks. Um, so students uh, clearly uh, place more value on a less expensive black and white than the uh, potential pedagogical value of color. Um, PIYs, or uh, PDF files that they can download uh, and use on their own, and these didn't come out right, but this is audiobooks at 3%, and this is um, e-reader files. This is basically the EPUB and the Mobi. Um, when you buy an e-book e from us, you download both of those formats so that if you ever switch from a, a, a EPUB reading device to a Mobi device or vice versa, you've got them both on your bookshelf. Um, and we also see lots of those getting installed, what we think. We don't know where those are going, actually. That's the issue. I don't know if they're being read on a laptop, uh, on a, an iPhone, through a, a, an e-reader, or uh, through a handheld um, dedicated e-reading device. But 6% of students are buying those. Um, student success data. Um, and we actually have uh, one of the uh, authors of a, of a study, basically, Bob Livingston, um, a professor at Cerritos College. Uh, and their perspective was, if students are dropping out uh, of courses and, and, and having hampered success because of the cost of textbooks, if we remove that barrier, what will happen? Logically, they should be more successful. Um, so, so Bob actually led the adoption of those books in the study, um, and the president of the college uh, published an article uh, a while back where they, they said that they saw in these three introductory business courses, 
um, total uh, course completion rates rise between 10 and 15 percent. Uh, interesting piece of that, I didn't give all the detailed data, but a but small bit of that was in traditional classrooms. Huge chunk of that came out of the distance learning courses. So students in online programs uh, did significantly better uh, when using open textbooks. Um, and no statistical uh, difference in GPA. Um, student comments are pretty interesting. Um, uh, give us the necessary tool. These are students in those three classes. Give us the tools to succeed, we will. Uh, expand open source textbooks to other classes. I like open source books because of cost, availability, and flexibility. I'd recommend them to my friends. Um, I recommend and encourage other students to sign up for classes that use open source textbooks. These are interesting comments because these are the pressure points that I think are starting to exert themselves in the marketplace as students start to become aware that this option exists. They're starting to ask for it and going to the classes uh, where it's been um, used. Um, yeah, Bob just did a study recently um, and um, forwarded us some of the data. So well, one of the big issues for students when they start in class is I don't know how to use an open source textbook. It feels new. Um, and uh, so um, in the most recent survey, how difficult it is it to use? 86% not difficult at all. Um, pretty easy to figure out. 80% uh, said they actually thought the quality of the open textbooks were better uh, than the quality of the traditional textbooks they were using in other classes. And, and as Bob put it in his... Uh, in this data, the aha number is that 96.5% of students said that the department should continue to look for more open source textbooks for more classes. And they're beginning to sort of go and flow to those places where they're being used. Uh, one other data point, Virginia State, um, they, they use open textbooks in now 16 business classes. Um, they started with their eight core required business classes, added eight more, that was last year, and eight more this year. They're about to publish a study. Uh, so I couldn't give specific numbers, but they're willing to let us say that early indicators that more students are staying in uh, those classes or course completion rates, and they're seeing similar, I think, results to what Cerritos was seeing. Um, and they have data showing that um, for students who actually took advantage, registered, logged in, and utilized the resources versus those that didn't, they saw statistically almost a full percentage GPA point difference uh, between those using the materials and those not using uh, the materials. <laughs> Um, it, uh, this was the number. So, do, so they were trying to figure out, does it matter? You know, if we solve this problem, does it really make any difference? So uh, in three of the courses where they took a snapshot, um, uh, there's the GPA with the textbook for students who had logged in and utilized, for students who had never done so, uh, there was the GPA uh, without uh, access to the textbook materials. Um, and then I'll, I'll conclude with a, uh, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to um, some of this data. So we did a partnership with the University System of Ohio through the uh, Chancellor uh, and the Board of Regents, and um, they're using open textbooks across six community colleges in a fairly significant pilot with an IRB-approved uh, formal study in place. And so um, you can see that you know it's 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 about cost savings for the system that they're trying to figure out if that's going to work. But more importantly, I think is. Um, teaming up to, to measure student learning and see if ultimately open textbooks demonstrate improved student learning. And if, if the snippets of data we're seeing in other places play out here, um, that's going to be a pretty significant uh, finding, I think. So uh, with that, we've got five minutes remaining, um, so we can, we can take questions or discussion. Yeah. One of the things I thought I would hear you guys mention, a compelling reason for digital textbooks in my mind, is the single word search. Do, is that something that people find really compelling and you see it in like a list of reasons? Yeah, I actually had uh, student data that I didn't present on the things that they like about um, uh, about things. The price was number one. Right. Um, and But I think, if I remember, number three was the ability to search. So number two was, uh, and it's just a pedagogical feature, we pull out all the key terms into the margins when you roll over them, it pulls up a definition. So when students are trying to study, they scan the margins, roll over the key terms, and get the definitions. That was their second favorite, but the third was the ability to search um, and, and to find material quickly. Because by and large, there aren't a lot of students linearly consuming textbooks. They're, they're, they're looking for bits and pieces of information to prepare for something. Uh, and so search helps them a lot in that, that method of, of utilizing a textbook. So how... Uh... I assume that revenue for you guys spikes during quarters or semesters. 
Um, is that true, and how do you? Yeah, it spikes. It's, it's like six weeks of the year. <laughs> Although we actually generate a lot from bookstores, so we start to see, you know, the sales cycle, if you think about it over a year, is sell intensively during the spring semester. That's when faculty review and mentally adopt and, and make a decision. Um, and then you start to see small sales in the summer classes uh, if people are testing things, but most of the sales then occur in fall. So you see this kind of bookstore. Uh, orders starting to pour in in July and August, and revenue starting to spike, and then you see really um, mid-August to um, the third week in September, when when all the online revenue is generated from students, and then you see a smaller version of all that when the winter semester repeats. So you see December bookstore orders, and then you see a spike uh, in January in online revenue, and then the rest of the year it kind of peters in and out based on quarter schools and for-profit colleges and and students at home schooling programs and stuff like that. It's actually the hard thing for investors to get used to, by the way. No, but but it's, it is what it is, and there's nothing you can do about it, so they, you just have to educate, and then they understand. Yeah, back there. Yeah. Um, one of the, by the way, the issue was uh, how to buy the books, right. uh, how to adopt the books. And these are not sort of totally books, or is it correct? Well, yeah, that's one of the, I think one of the tricky issues with open textbooks in general. I mean, for us, we tried to make that process fairly turnkey. So you, you go to a book, and whether you're in the book reader looking at it or on a catalog page, a professor says adopt, and, and it basically gives them a requisition form, just like the bookstore requisition form. They fill out some information, click submit. Um, we instantly send them, uh, a, give them a page that says, great, here's the URL where you're, you can give to your students. You can cut and paste it into your syllabus, your... Um, uh, or your uh, LMS. Um, here's the ISBNs you can give to the bookstore. Um, and by the way, we'll send it to them anyway, so don't worry about it, and we'll turn around and do that. And we also um, follow up with an email to their account that they just registered for with that same information. Uh, it also gets stored in their account, so they can go to their account and get it at any time. We also put that class in a class finder. So if they forget everything and just say, go to flywellknowledge.com and find it, the students go there and it says, students enter here, enter your class, they put in a school and a professor, it pulls up the link and they click and they go right to the professor's book. So, so we've tried to make it easy. You might be able to respond sort of more broadly. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenges you've identified are like the ones that we're observing elsewhere. You know, professors are used to turning in their adoption form at the bookstore. All of a sudden, there's this online resource that lives online, and you order online. How do I do that? Some of the open textbooks, yours have ISBNs. Not all do. How do you handle that? Um, so there are a lot of a lot of challenges, and, and education is really just the key to that. Yeah, the, the student they could buy the good <coughs> have a choice to buy directly or through a bookstore because some bookstores charge 40% right. markup. Right. So your store cost is $34 plus 40%. Right. right, that's right. And we've always maintained that we'll sell books through the bookstore and they can mark up whatever they're going to, but we will always have that book available for sale on our site. So the student, it, it keeps a, a governor on bookstores because they're not going to be willing to have that much of a gap between their price and our price. Well, I mean, it's like that with any, any book. You can go on Amazon.com and buy any virtually any textbook you can buy in a bookstore for less. Uh, we'll take one more question and then we've got to end. It's a question from actually the last uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, I think, what the revenue share model is for your authors. So our authors get 20% uh, of any dollar that we generate around their open content, and that's anything. Uh, anywhere in the world. So typical industry average is 13%. Um, and, and, and what we say is, look, um, we're in this together. You've, you've chosen to, to publish an open textbook with us. There's free content online. That brings traffic. It's now our job as a company to figure out how to make money from that and share that with you. So today they get paid for, for example, any formats that are purchased. Uh, but we create the study aids um, and, and sell them, and we pay them 20% of the study aid proceeds. Um, if we generate, we've had conversations here with people about services that they provide, um, I would say tutoring services or highlighting services, and if we sold that and a student spent you know, $15 for some tutoring, we would share 20% of that with the author. So the authors feel like we're aligned because their sense is good. We're both in this to sort of figure out creative ways to continue to tweak the business model around open content because I'm always going to get paid. Awesome. And traditional publishers don't share that. Right? No, no, not so not. much. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody.